disclaimer, this presentation contains some graphic images just made by Medicine in Action, so viewer discretion is advised. So, as a background, I'm a herpetologist in the wilderness antique. Started out here with a snake guide, and then went to the logical place for a guy who likes snakes and medicine to go, which was snake bite medicine. Uh, so let's talk about the issue of snake bite here. In the 21st century, snake bite is the most neglected of all neglected tropical diseases. So quote by Dr. David Worrell, a world expert in snake bite from Oxford University. And what that basically compares it to is malaria, typhoid fever, river blindness, all of these other diseases that get a lot of press and a lot of money. So snake bites in the same category in terms of impact, uh, but not in terms of actual awareness and funding to address it. So we see that there are 500,000 to a million and a half snake bites estimated for sub-Saharan Africa every single year. To put that in perspective, uh, in the United States, we have 5,000 bites per year and five deaths on an average year. We don't really know about the deaths for sub-Saharan Africa. And we don't really know how many bites there are because we have pretty poor data. Uh, what we do know is we have 20,000 vials of antivenom produced each year to treat all of those bites. And from personal experience treating a lot of bites in Africa, I can say that many bites will require two to four vials of serum to treat. Uh, so what we really need is something like 500,000 or two and a half million vials, depending on what your estimate of bites is. Uh, which we really don't have. As a result, any serum that's given to someone who doesn't need it is just as bad as someone getting serum when they, uh, or not getting serum when they do. Either way, a person dies. Uh, so what we see is that about 10% of snake bite patients actually get treated in Africa. The rest, uh, it's sort of a good luck scenario. Snake bite touches everyone in Africa. Uh, what this really means is you can talk to anyone in Africa and they have a story for you about a brother, a mother, sister, father, cousin who has been killed by a snake, and it creates a lot of stigma, and this perpetuates all the way up to the medical people who are treating bites. What we see is that in Africa, there's a vicious cycle perpetuated when someone's bit by a snake. So let's follow someone through it. This gentleman here is Sumela. He's a patient of mine in Benin, and he was bit by a puff adder. It's the snake right there. Sumela was out hunting for food for his family when he stepped on his snake. Uh, generally, when snakes and people clash, it leads to snake bite. And the clashes generally occur when a breadwinner is out farming or hunting for food, therefore the impact is even greater. Snake conflict leads to snake bites, and snake bites in Africa invariably end up at the traditional medicine guide. So which doctor in Benin? Uh, what he's holding is a jar of sand, which he told me is antivenom, and if you take it in your porridge twice a day for three to five days, you'll get better. Well, you won't actually get better, but you will get much worse uh, because the longer the venom is circulating in your body, the more damage it does. So we have a serious treatment delay that's caused by going to the witch doctor first. A more common treatment I saw, uh, which you can see in the bottom right corner, this isn't just a dirty foot. This gentleman actually has uh, 40 incisions made with a rusty blade, and then a mix of dung and dirt rubbed into the wounds. That's a great way to get tetanus and secondary infection on board. Uh, so patients end up very late arriving at the hospital and with very serious complications, both from the delayed treatment and the bad uh, original treatment that they got. Then, a lot of these bites are happening in rural areas, so our patients now have to get to a hospital. In Africa, that's quite a dangerous endeavor sometimes. You can see that wrecked truck there is actually just about the nicest road I've traveled in Africa. If you're traveling a short distance, you'll go by Zemijan, or Bajaj, as they call it in East Africa, that's a little motorcycle. If you're going a long way, you'll probably hit your ride in the back of a truck full of vegetables or cattle or something else. Uh, and if you make it there, if you survive the bite, the traditional treatment, the delay, and the transport, and the dangerous roads, you make it to a hospital, there's some more issues waiting you. Does that hospital have the supplies that you need? Do they have the right antivenom and the right dose? Do they have staff that know what they're doing treating snake bites? Uh, and can they prescribe the proper medication? And then do you have the money to pay for that? Um, and even worse, can you be seen in time? Sometimes there's a wait when you arrive at a clinic of two or three days before you're actually seen. So you may make it all the way there, having survived every other step in the cycle, and then uh, die because you can't afford treatment. It's quite a bad situation. What we see is that all of this adds up to create very bad outcomes. Um, if you go to a hospital, it's very expensive, and generally you won't fare so well because you've waited so long uh, and everything else we've already spoken about. But if you go to the witch doctor, 50% of the time, you're going to get better. And that's probably uh, not because you were sick at all. What we see is that with venomous snakes, there's a phenomenon called dry bites, where 50% of bites from venomous snakes don't actually involve the injection of venom. 
You can think of it like this. You're not edible to a snake, so a snake doesn't want to waste its venom on you, uh, which is hard to make. We're not sure that's why it happens, but that's the best guess I can give you here today. So a witch doctor's patients, they go there, they pay a little bit of money, and they get better half the time. The rest of them wait a long time before they come to us and are in a very bad state of affairs when they get there. Uh, so we create a vicious cycle, and the next time someone is thrust into this, where are they going to go? Probably back to the witch doctor. From a treatment perspective, we have even more issues. Um, first and foremost, that doctors, again, have grown up with this stigma about snakes. So they don't want to really learn about the different types of snakes that are there, and there's a lot to learn about. Uh, there's about 400 different species of snake in Africa. Out of those, about 90 are venomous with a clinical significance. That means they could hurt you. 30 of those have been proven to kill. And then I'd say there's another five or six that could potentially be lethal. Uh, we just don't know, and that's kind of a problem for Africa. We don't have as much data as we'd like. So there's one thing that works to our favor, and that's that although there's a lot of snakes, we can diagnose and treat snake bites based on the symptoms expressed by a patient. In this case, we have two different snakes, a cobra and a mamba. Uh, both of these, however, have similar venoms. They're neurotoxic. What they cause uh, is this. This gentleman was bit by a forest cobra. You can see he has drooping eyelids. The venom attacks the nervous system, and it paralyzes, moving from the head downward. He can't open his eyes. It's called ptosis. He also can't stick out his tongue. And very shortly after, he won't be able to breathe when it hits his diaphragm. I didn't see any neurotoxic bites in Benin, probably because these patients weren't making it to the clinic. Uh, they die very quickly, in some cases less than an hour. The other type of bites that we see are from vipers, and these are much more common to make it to a clinic. Um, this is a puff adder here. It's a very large snake. That's the one that bit Sumela. Puff adders and other vipers cause one of two syndromes generally. This is pain, swelling, tissue destruction. The foot on the right belongs to a gentleman who didn't make it to treatment for two and a half weeks. Uh, he couldn't afford it and went to a witch doctor. On the left is the hand of the gentleman who came in three hours after the bite. You can see I've made lines here to mark the progression of swelling, progression of bleeding, uh, blistering, etc. while I'm treating him. And within six hours, we've reached the right dose of antivenom. The swelling has stopped, and he recovered full function of his hand. Uh, the man with the bite to his foot may not recover function and may lose his foot. Death from these bites is often very slow due to kidney failure or uh, secondary infection. The other syndrome we see with vipers is a bleeding syndrome. Uh, essentially, you get all of the pain, swelling, tissue destruction of the last bunch, uh, except that you add in a lot of local bleeding, and then local bleeding becomes systemic. So what happens is the venom turns you into a functional hemophiliac, and then pokes your blood vessels full of holes. Obviously, that could be problematic. This is an old cut that's opened up, a scab that's dissolved. That happens quite frequently. Uh, the next stage is bleeding from the mouth, the eyes, the nose, vomiting blood. Uh, this will ultimately be fatal, either due to bleeding in the brain that this gentleman here is suffering from, or bleeding into the abdomen. This is two liters of blood drained from the abdomen of a nine-year-old girl. Uh, both of these patients lived because they got antivenom, and that's an important thing to remember. Uh, however, if they didn't get it, those would have been fatal, invariably. So what does it look like treating snake bite now that you've seen what the problems are? What do we actually need to do to fix it? One problem we face is that we're not yet at a point for Africa where we can take a well-intentioned idea from the classroom or the academic environment here and cut and paste it onto the realities of the situation there and have it work. We really need to go out and get our hands dirty and try and put things uh, into the perspective of Africa in order to find solutions. So that's what I did. I spent eight months there from June of 2012 to January of 2013 doing a clinical trial on an antivenom, and I'll show you what this looks like. Uh, so I went to Benin. It's a little key-shaped country in the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. I was posted to a bush hospital in the north in Bambareke. It's very dry, very rural, uh, quite isolated, and a lot of snake bites occur there. So the hospitals there aren't quite what we would expect a hospital to be here. Uh, they're open air, they're bungalows, it's called a French colonial style hospital. Uh, basically the idea is if an infection hits pediatric, something like, say, Ebola, uh, you can seal off that ward and the medicine ward can still function. Uh, they're also quite low on supplies a lot of the time, and it's not, not really the same level of care you get here, but people do their best. So in order to address snake bite, we can sort of sum up three approaches that need to be taken at the same time. One of these is direct interventions. So interventions in the sense of bringing good antivenom to hospitals and treating patients directly to improve outcomes. This is a classic situation. Gentleman arrives with a snake bite, snakes in a bottle, 
It's dead. He killed it. I look at it. It's got speckles on its belly. It's a carpet viper or a saw-skill viper. Uh, based on the bleeding in his mouth, which I'm looking at there, I can diagnose the severity of the syndrome, prescribe a good amount of antivenom, and push an IV uh, amount of that serum to treat him. So that's pretty much how interventions go. And the idea is to improve the outcome directly so people come back and learn that they won't die at a hospital. Uh, research is also very important. As long with treating bites, we need to get a better idea of what's actually out there. Part of that involves catching snakes. People get bit sometimes when they clash with snakes in their homes, in their fields. Uh, so generally, I go and inform the population that I'm a snake guy, I'm here. If you find a snake, will you call? You tend to find some interesting things. You might remember we didn't see any neurotoxic bites in Benin. Uh, the people at the hospital told me that these snakes just weren't there. Well, on the right there was a forest cobra, which I caught at about 10 feet from my bedroom, uh, trying to break into the AIDS patient ward. So they are definitely there. It's just probably that patients aren't making it to the clinic. So why catch the snakes? Partially to reduce conflict directly, but partially to collect data and uh, information on the venom. Venom can vary from an old snake to a young snake, from a snake here to a snake 10 miles away, from a male to a female. Uh, from species to species, a lot of variation. So if we get a better idea of uh, what the venom is in different snakes in different areas, we can pool that to create more effective antivenoms. Education is also critically important. Obviously, I'm one guy. Uh, my colleagues at the Biopen Snake Farm are one group of people. Uh, we can only intervene directly in so many places, but what we can do is focus on train-the-trainer approaches, and that's both while treating bites and doing these direct interventions, as well as the larger seminars like this. And the idea is to basically educate teams of doctors, nurses, medics, and folks who are treating this um, problem in better ways to manage snake bites so that they can spread this knowledge and get a wider sphere of influence. So why should you actually care about this? This is why I think you should care. This is Majidu. He's a seven-year-old boy, and he's a patient of mine from Benin. Majidu was bit by a carpet viper, that's our bleeding snake, and his father took him to a witch doctor. For three days, he took the witch doctor's treatment and began to bleed and bleed and bleed. Uh, his eye is swelling here because he scratched at it and he had eczema. Uh, now it's blown up, it's engorged with blood, uh, and he's bleeding very severely. He has a critically low hematocrit, that means his red cell count is low, he's anemic, and he's very close to death. The great thing about treating snake bites, though, is that seemingly up to the last few minutes before death, patients can improve and improve dramatically. I gave Majidu some basic treatment, a couple of vials of antivenom, some fluids, some antibiotics, a little bit of pain medication, that's it. Uh, one day later, Majidu is looking significantly better. He's stabilized. Two days later, the swelling is going down. Three days later, dramatic improvement. His eyes open, how many fingers? Three, two, one. His vision's fine. By day four, Majidu is looking sassy again, looking like a normal kid. Day five, Majidu is going home, completely recovered, no lasting injury. Without antivenom, Majidu would have been dead. And uh, that's why snake bite medicine matters to me. If you think about what's the cost of treating a snake bite patient in the short term uh, versus the long term implications, the long term cost of death or disability in Africa. In Africa, if the breadwinner dies, that challenge is passed on to the family, which passes on to the village, because the village steps up, that passes on to the community, and that will be born for generations. Uh, it's a huge toll that catches up when you don't treat these bites. In Majidu's case, uh, this is what it took to treat him, $40 of antivenom, that's it. Uh, that's why snake bite medicine is important. And how do we actually solve this on a larger scale? How do we intervention in one place, like Ben Bereke, Benin, where I went, actually solve snake bite? Well, what we see is that by going in and focusing on this approach of research, intervention, and education, take that cycle we saw before, that vicious cycle that perpetuates bad outcomes, and we turn it on its head. We can educate villagers in better ways to uh, live around the snakes that are there, in better ways to respond to snake bites. A project pioneered by Biochem in Kenya is to talk to witch doctors and tell them, if you see a snake bite and it's bad, tell them that your magic isn't working today and they should go to the hospital, and it works. These people want to save face. Educating doctors, too, is very important, and educating policymakers on correct antivenoms to stop, because oftentimes it's the cheapest one uh, that's chosen. And then research, again, to get better products. When we focus on this, what we do is change the outcomes, and we turn this cycle on its head. If we go back to Sumela, 
Sumela is sort of a, a patriarch of this village. He's the father of, it seems to me, most of the village of Gondo. Uh, he's quite a, quite a good guy. He's become a good friend of mine as well. And Sumela would come over for breakfast and lunch, and we would uh, talk about things in the village, and he would take me to his field uh, to remove snakes and introduce me to villagers. And Sumela would also bring snake bite patients to the hospital. He would spread the word as an individual, hey, I got bit and I survived, and they'll treat you here, and you don't have to die. And when one person survives, uh, they save other lives. And when you do this in Benin, you treat about 40 patients there. Everyone goes back to their village, and that spreads like wildfire. So how do you solve snake bite? I mean, the idea of TED is to spread big ideas. Uh, the way we solve snake bite is to do the same thing. You go to an area, you focus on a small-scale project of research, intervention, and education. You change the outcomes, you change the cycle, you get enough ripples in a pond, uh, and you begin to actually cause an effect that uh, spreads across Africa and solves snake bite for the region. So that's how we solve snake bite. Thank you very much for coming tonight.